Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone please in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or to silent so that they don't affect the committee's work. Item 1, decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take items 3 and 4 in private this morning? Thank you. Item two, Scotland Act 2016, audit and accountability arrangements. We will now take evidence on the Scotland Act 2016 and these arrangements. And I welcome Eleanor Ryan, Director of Financial Strategy, Aileen Wright, Head of Corporate Reporting, Accountancy and Governance, Andrew Chapman, Team Leader, Fiscal Delivery and Constitutional Cha Change for all the Scottish Government, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, and Mark Taylor, Assistant Director of Audit Scotland. I'd like to invite an opening statement from Eleanor Ryan and then the Auditor General. Thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, and thank you for inviting us to, uh, to come and discuss this audit and accountability framework. I think the, the clerk's note sets out a very clear account of the, the origin and history um, of the document. The, the key some key principles for the audit and accountability framework were set out in the technical annex of the fiscal framework itself. These were that audit arrangements should be efficient and effective, should avoid duplication and should not result in auditors becoming overburdened. We've had these principles in mind, as well as the more succinct principles set out in the public, uh, by the Public Audit Committee, uh, that the framework should be proportionate, transparent and robust. These have informed our discussions with uh, uh, HM Treasury officials, uh, which have resulted in the draft. Um, and they, we've also had very important input from Audit Scotland and the National Audit Office. It's really important to Scottish ministers that the Scottish Parliament, through this committee, has an opportunity to review and comment on the framework and help shape it uh, before a final version is agreed through the Joint Exchequer Committee so we're here today. Look forward to discussing any points the committee wishes to raise. Thank you very much. Auditor General. Thank you, Convener. I know some people might see this morning's subject matter as a bit dry and technical, so I'm grateful for the committee's interest and we'll um, do our best to set out for you why we think it matters. Um, I'll also briefly summarise my views on the draft which is set out in the submission that you have before you. Uh, the committee knows very well the fundamental changes to Scotland's public finances that are coming through as a result of the Scotland Act 2016. A number of UK bodies now have an important role in functions that are central to the Scottish Parliament's responsibilities, including Scottish income tax, aspects of devolved social security, VAT assignment and the detailed operation of the fiscal framework that governs all of that. The Audit and Accountability Framework will determine the ability of the Scottish Parliament and its committees to scrutinise these areas, including how UK bodies report to the Scottish Parliament, how they respond to requests for information and evidence, and how this is underpinned by the audit process. These are all likely to be critical areas for the Parliament's committees as they scrutinise the operation of the new powers. In my view, the draft framework has got some important strengths. It provides a reasonable basis for direct accountability of UK public bodies to the Scottish Parliament, where that's relevant, and it reinforces the role of independent public audit, both in fully developed, devolved areas and where UK bodies are involved. I've also highlighted some areas where I think it could be strengthened further to better support accountability to the Scottish Parliament, including the provisions for value for money audit in UK bodies that undertake devolved responsibilities. Ultimately, ultimately, it's for the two governments to agree on the arrangements that are put in place, but it's important for the committee to be able to contribute to those arrangements on behalf of the Parliament as a whole. Together with colleagues from the government, we'll do our best to help you with that. Thank you very much indeed. I'm now going to open to questioning. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Honourable General, um, over a period of several years, this committee has obviously been interested in the uh, arrangements between the devolved administration and the and the UK government in terms of how to implement uh, the uh, various acts that have come in. In all that time, we've had reassurances that uh, all was well and that it was going smoothly. This is the first time that we've had anything negative. Would there be an occasion previously where this could have been raised to us? during the time that this was being negotiated? 
so that the Public Audit Committee could have its uh, input? I think the first thing to say is that I wouldn't see this as being negative. I think it's an important next step on the journey of fiscal devolution. Um, the Scotland Act 2016, as this committee has considered several times, radically increases um, the financial powers of the Scottish Parliament. It increases the amount of revenue that's raised here in Scotland from about 10% of what we spend to close to 50% when it's fully in effect. And it devolves about £3 billion worth of social security benefits as well. So that's a big step change that's happening at the moment. Um, the committee will recall that in the first meeting of 2018, um, you had the reports from the Comptroller and Auditor General and myself about the Scottish rate of income tax. That was the last year in which the um, 10 pence rate was uh, the power that's in place. And we're now moving into a world where effectively all of income tax on earned income is within the gift of the Scottish Parliament, plus VAT, plus Social Security. Um, I've said to this committee before that, in my view, the arrangements we had in place for the 2012 Act have served us well, but that step change means that it's, it's time to reconsider how they need to develop, and I think this draft framework is the process by which that's happening. Now, unless I'm wrong, Eleanor Ryan was indicating that uh, yourself, Auditor General, Audit Scotland, had input into this document. Now, given the reservations that you've listed here, does that mean that you were overruled on that or that uh, uh, there was a disagreement on this? I wouldn't characterise it that way at all. I think the, the primary discussions have been going on between um, Eleanor's colleagues in the Scottish Government and uh, UK colleagues in Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, both uh, of those uh, parties have been discussing with their national auditors, Scottish Government with me as Auditor General for Scotland, Treasury with the Comptroller and Auditor General and the NAO. Um, and as I said in my submission and in my opening remarks, I think there are some significant strengths and many of our contributions have been taken on board. Um, I think we're um, in front of the committee this morning, A, so the committee has a chance to input its views, and secondly, so that you can be aware of the areas where I think it could be strengthened further. I wouldn't want that to be taken as me sounding an alarm bell, that I think the framework isn't fit for purpose. I've heard some of the things you see here as a bit more than asking for it to be strengthened. You're actually picking out some weaknesses here, and uh, I think that's important. Um, Elna Ryan, you, you, you said that Auditor General was, or Audit Scotland was fully engaged in this. Why do we end up at this point with a document that the Auditor General has some issues with? Um, so I, I think it's important to recognise that in, in working, that, that earlier drafts um, have really benefited hugely from the points that the Auditor General and her colleagues have raised. So you have, a, you have a much better draft framework at this point. This is a negotiation between two governments involving two national audit bodies. So there's um, one, one individual set of views can't necessarily change everything in the framework. We, um, we recognise several of the points the Auditor General has raised and we will, we will very happily go back and represent those again uh, in further discussion with, with the Treasury. Um, it, there's, no, uh, there's no sense in which the Scottish Government is trying to resist the points that Audit Scotland has raised. These points must have been raised before with the Treasury, presumably, uh, and they must have disagreed? Some have. I think not necessarily all the points that the Auditor General is now making have been raised before. Hmm. Well, looking at the, the actual document itself, I must say it would benefit from plain English. Um, it's fairly obscure in places, and, uh, you know, governments these days are supposedly trying to bring in uh, documents that can be read by the layman and understood by the layman. And I have to say that uh, some bits of this are very close to gobbledygook. However, we have what we have. I'd like to bring up just one or two specific points. Um, on page six of the draft, item four, uh, the second paragraph about the secondary auditor ensuring that it's confirmed that the primary auditor is content for the work to be carried out. Does that mean the primary auditor has a veto if the secondary auditor feels that there is, uh, there is some uh, examination or investigation that is required? And is there a mechanism to resolve that? So we would expect that um, the primary auditor would take account of the views of 
both parliaments in setting out their, their programme of work um, and that there would be good cooperation between the two. Are there guidelines for that or are you speculating? Uh, I think that point is raised in the draft framework. If you feel that needs to be strengthened, that's another point that we can obviously take back. But is well, I'm, I'm trying to ascertain whether, you, whether, whether there's something that will create a guideline for this or a mechanism for, for, for this or whether it's simply you think that's the way it should be so there's, I think it's a principal point. I think that the other principal point is the independence of audit bodies. And there is, there's something in, in the drafting that um, officials between the two governments need to be careful of. I and mean, we're, we're drafting a framework. Um, it's absolutely essential. It doesn't cut across the freedom of the audit bodies. Uh, the Auditor General may well have a view on that also. Which means it would benefit from clarity. Just add to Eleanor's point, it's one of the areas where I do think the framework could be strengthened to reflect the interests of this Parliament and the views that the predecessor committee um, has expressed. Um, I think um, while the National Audit Office, the Comptroller and Auditor General and I have every interest in making this work in practice, um, there are circumstances in which the requirement for uh, the Comptroller and Auditor General to agree that I do some work in HMRC, for example, and for that body itself to agree could limit my um, rights of access. Um, we will do our best to make it work, but I thought it was worth flagging to the committee here that I think is more limited than the Parliament might, might ideally like. So taking the example you've got there, if the National Audit uh, decides to veto the work, that's it. I, I have no rights of access under the proposed framework except with, for uh, value for money aud auditing, performance auditing, with the agreement of the Comptroller and Auditor General and with the agreement of HMRC. Um, now, that um, has not been a problem so far. Um, I think there are incentives in the system for the CNA, GNI to continue working well together to serve the interests and needs of both of our parliaments, but I thought it was right to highlight to you that there is a potential limitation there on the extent to which I can uh, provide assurance to this parliament about the way that UK bodies like HMRC are delivering significant devolved responsibilities on behalf of the parliament. I don't doubt the, the goodwill on all sides to make this work. But surely there should be some sort of mechanism where one party can't just say no without there being some sort of a, a forum where that can be uh, discussed and uh, you know, at a higher level, surely. The current memor memorandum of understanding between me and the Comptroller and Auditor General does um, include a, a dispute resolution, re resolution mechanism which effectively escalates it to the two of us to resolve it. Um, beyond that, the um, safeguard that's in place, I think, would be my ability to report to this Parliament that I felt there was a need for a particular piece of work to be carried out, um, that the CNAG didn't agree, um, or in fact that HMRC hadn't agreed and therefore I hadn't been able to do it. So there is a safeguard there in terms of public reporting. Um, I don't think it's a do or die around the framework as it's currently drafted, but I do think it's something that the committee may wish to express its views on. If there's a, any sort of a, a difference between this document and the document you've negotiated with the NEO, which document prevails? Um, there's no doubt that this framework agreed between ministers would be the starting point. Um, so that would prevail. Absolutely. So any agreement you have with the NAO would be subject to whatever terms are in this. I think the next step would be once this framework is agreed between ministers, the memor memorandum of understanding between me and the CNAG would need to be updated to reflect this. Um, so we would have in there, um, again, a process for agreeing differences of, differences of view between us. I think there would be no, um, no further option within that other than uh, a safeguard of me being able to uh, report to Parliament if I felt that there was work that I would like to do that I wasn't able to do under the framework. Would there not be a benefit if your document was at least referenced in this document so that it has some validity in terms of what the ministers are agreeing? Um, I and think it's taken there, into account. I think there might be merit in doing that, and I'm just checking with Mark. I think the existing agreement um, already includes a reference to the MOU. Mark, do you want to fill in the details? So, so there's, a, there's a broad aspect of the agreement which effectively, uh, sorry, the, 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 the 
audit and accountability framework that's in front of you today, which sets out provisions for different parties to put in writing the detailed arrangements that we have. So if you like, there's a provision in the framework that says that ourselves and the National Audit Office can put in writing a memorandum of understanding. So there is a link to existing memorandum of understanding and how it's referenced to the framework as it's set out in the draft. Mm. Just to move on to... Oh, another. I think Ian Gray wanted to develop this point okay. specifically, so I'll bring Ian in and come back to you. Ian Gray. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask the Auditor-General a, a bit more about this uh, issue around particularly um, the situation where the, Sc the, the Scottish Government uses a UK public body and has no choice. And the, exam the obvious example is the Scottish rate of income tax. And, but just to try it right back to the Auditor-General's introductory remarks, um, you made very clear the step change which was taking place between the 2012 current position and the new position just beginning. And in paragraph 34 um, of uh, your submission, Auditor General, you say the draft framework does not significantly develop the audit model for Scottish income tax. <coughs> so, so are you saying that we have this huge step change taking place uh, and the framework does not recognise or reflect that in any way whatsoever. Um, it's useful to have the chance to expand on, on this point. Um, I think there are two dimensions to it. One is, relation, is in relation to the financial audit of HMRC and within that the collection of the Scottish, of Scottish income tax in future. Um, there are already, um, within the accounting standards and the auditing standards, well-developed arrangements for um, effectively a, a group auditor to um, place reliance on the work of um, the uh, auditor of the bodies that make up that group and vice versa. Those arrangements are in place and work well, um, and you have the uh, mechanism in place by which the CNAG, under the legislation, reports to this parliament about the financial statements, and I provide additional assurance, which tells you that I think the work has covered the right issues um, and can place it into the Scottish context. I think that works well, and I can't see good reasons for changing it. Where, I'm, uh, where I think the framework could be strengthened um, is in relation to performance and value for money audit, um, which could be looking at things like the efficiency with which the taxes are collected, the service provided to Scottish taxpayers, um, where at the moment I have no rights of access and this framework doesn't go very much further around that. I've said in evidence to this committee before that I think the step change we're seeing in the amount of um, fiscal responsibility this parliament has means that's worth reviewing um, and this doesn't move it very much further along the lines that Mr Beattie has expressed. So, so th that that's what you mean uh, in your submission in paragraph 28 when you say in my view broadening the provisions for access to UK bodies in these circumstances would strengthen the framework and better satisfy the needs the Scottish Parliament has identified. Is that, in broad is that terms, fair? Yes. But I, I suppose my question then is how that would happen um, uh, and whether it's simply a matter of negotiation and the agreement in the framework, or, or if something more profound is required, because going back to paragraph 34, the, um, the next sentence reads, in my view, meeting the statutory requirements which were established in relation to the more limited powers in the 2012 Act, which then, in my mind, begs the question, do you think there should have been statutory requirements in the 2016 Act to cover the, the broader position, but there weren't. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, I think there is scope in, in the ways that I've suggested in my submission to give more um, assurance to the Scottish Parliament about the audit work that's carried out of UK bodies. I think that the framework takes us a fair way along that road, and I'm highlighting to you this particular question about the value for money audit. Um, there, there clearly will be in future quite a range of different, of different um, relationships between UK bodies and the Scottish Government and Scottish public bodies. The one that I'm highlighting for you is, as being potentially short of what this committee and the Parliament has expressed it would like is around um, the value for money audit responsibilities in relation to UK public bodies where the Scottish Government has had no choice but to use the services and HMRC. I'm still struggling to try and envisage what it is 
which would give you comfort that that access would be, in, in your view, um, sufficient in order to provide that that uh, comfort to us, I suppose, and to the Parliament. Yes. Uh, is it a, 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 a different section, an addi additional section, a change to one of the principles contained here, if, if it's not a change in statute then? I think in some ways it goes back to Mr Beattie's um, questions. At the starting point for all of this is that um, the CNA, GNI, HMRC and the Scottish Government have got many incentives to make this work, but we want the framework to be designed to um, take account of problems that, that we haven't yet encountered. We don't want to be designing what the arrangements look like when, when a problems come up. The framework as it's currently drafted gives me access subject to the agreement of the Comptroller and Auditor General and of HMRC. Um, and although we haven't encountered problems yet, um, it's possible to envisage situations where this Parliament might feel that it would like a piece of work doing that the CNAG feels isn't necessary or more likely that the timing isn't right for. And at the moment, there is effectively a veto around that. So what would be required would be to remove that veto? The conditions, yes. OK, thanks. Colin. I'll touch just briefly on a couple of points, but one comment I would make about the paper overall is that as a layman reading this, I would expect to see clarity and easy understanding. I don't see that. So from that point of view, I believe the, the document actually fails. Okay. Uh, but let me touch on a couple of points. On page 13 of the draft, uh, second bullet point, how do you define a distinct and significant impact on devolved matters in Scotland? How do you define that? Um, on, on point D at the top of the, of the page. Oh, that's correct. Yes, I mean, the, the, the text that is there is the attempt to explain that. Um, I'm, I'm understanding from your question that you don't consider that a sufficiently clear definition. You've given one or two examples here, HS2, immigration and so on, which do have a distinct and significant effect on, on, on Scotland. But obviously there's other things where there could be less ease of clarity as to whether they are having a significant impact and where that could become a contentious issue. So there should be some definition, some, some way of understanding that. Um, I, would, I would agree. Um, I think the, the difficulty in writing a framework like this is trying to encompass all the different sorts of circumstances that might arise, clearly, as you have said, and simply, but at the same time in a comprehensive way. So I can, we can take away the point that we need to try to clarify this. I, I'm not sure if I at the moment see a way to make that absolutely precise. If I you think have it's more having a process of how to define it right. rather than trying to define a list which will change over time anyway. And the second thing, the last thing I'd just like to raise is same page. Um, if you look under the heading of public bodies with more than one category of service delivery and look at the third paragraph, at the, at the judgment of the relative accounting officer, how does that work? I mean, that sounds like uh, the judgments are going to be made by the accounting officer <coughs> where there's no appeal or no comeback. It Which sounds arbitrary. And I would, I would take that as, as relating to your same general point, which is about how, how are disputes and disagreements or, or differences of opinion about how things should apply, how should they be resolved? And we can certainly see if we can come up with a way of making that, and, that clearer. And again, about the, the warning to accounting officers that they should take particular care when responding to any recommendations of a devolved legislature or executive on reserved policy areas. Um, would recommendations and so on go to the accounting of, account, to the accounting officer? I mean, what level are we talking about here in terms of if, for example, the Auditor General had a concern and she went to the accounting officer and the accounting officer said, no, nah, that's, that's a reserved matter, we're not going to get involved in that, where is the process for that to be escalated if it's something that's important? As I say, what I'm looking for here in this document is clarity as to how, 
where there is a conflict, where there is a disagreement, how it's escalated and how it's resolved? So I would, I would say ultimately we have two parliaments who each have an interest. Um, the, the, the document has been drafted between officials of the two governments, but I would certainly recognise the Scottish Parliament's interest and the UK Parliament's interest as primary here. And I don't... Uh, I think we're in the territory of how would one resolve a difference of opinion between two parliaments. I don't know if it would necessarily go to parliamentary level. I mean, I'm throwing this out to you, that, this, that there is lack of clarity in this as to what happens. 99%, there's going to be no problem at all. It'll all be done amicably. And yep. I would hope it'll all be done amicably. Indeed. Um, but there's go there could be a real difference of opinion yep. where, for example, the Auditor General felt there was a real problem that had to be investigated, and for some reason, technical or otherwise, the accounting officer yep. isn't going to engage. How do we resolve that? I, I think that's a very fair challenge. And I, th I, should, have, I should say that I think in this... In this, um, the Scottish Government's interests, Audit Scotland's interests, and indeed the Scottish Parliament's interests are aligned. It's, it's not in our interest as Scottish Government for Audit Scotland to be unable to um, uh, carry out audit work that is considered necessary on any kind of uh, devolved matter or any, any kind of matter which impinges on a, on a devolved area of interest. Um, and it's not in our interest either that there should be some arbitrary decision taken that that's... Um, that, the, that an accounting officer or anyone else is not willing to, to or um, a, reserve, a UK body is not willing to allow Audit Scotland to access. So um, we, we recognise all those points. The, some of these have been made in drafting before. I think this conversation with the committee today will strengthen our hand to go back to try to reflect some of those points more strongly in the draft. Auditor General, can I ask you, do you think that the... Um lack of clarity here is inevitable given the current devolution settlement and the you know the powers that have come but not all powers um or do you think there are areas of this that actually clearly um could be strengthened or clarified by the scottish government it's a really good question, Convener, and I think it's worth us all remembering the broad context is that the 1998 Scotland Act set a pretty clear devolution settlement. If a matter wasn't devolved, it was reserved, um, and um, you could draw a clear line between the two. We've now gradually, over the last 20 years or so, moved towards a situation where that line is much more wavy down the middle, that control over um, income tax in Scotland on earned income belongs to this parliament and to the government, but under the legislation it has to be collected by, D by HMRC. Um, the uh, social security ben benefits that have been devolved are quite clearly defined, but they interact with universal credit and the government has choice about the extent to which it wants to use DWP to administer some of that. So that line is much wavier and I think that inevitably brings some of the complexity that we're talking about here. In terms of the audit arrangements, which is my main interest um, in, in uh, supporting the interests of this committee and this parliament, I think the framework goes most of the way to fulfilling what's required and we've just highlighted the one area where I think the, the Parliament's interest could be safeguarded further. Um, I think this, this section on page 13 that Mr Beattie's been referring to in some ways is the most difficult one. Um, I think for the first time this framework recognises that now many more UK public bodies have some degree of accountability to the Scottish Parliament for services which they provide that have got a significant um, relationship with the devolved responsibilities of the Parliament, but that will vary a great deal from case to case. Um, I think Ellen is right that there needs to be a bit of flexibility in there. I think what this, this Parliament and the Committee um, will be keen to ensure is that, that the interest is firmly registered and that there's scope to develop and review the arrangements over time as they unfold. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, <coughs> Convener. <laughs> Um, where, where to start with this? Uh, I remember when I was on the Finance Committee at the early stages of our consideration <coughs> of SRIT convener and we discussed this exact issue about how Audit Scotland would interact with the NAO. And then the Memorandum of Understanding emerged, but I, my impression was at that time that there was a, a sensible 
and working relationship. But I have to say now, I'm a wee bit more concerned that there isn't. <laughs> when I look at your summary, Auditor General, on page two, it's quite worrying when you're, you're saying things like, there is no provision for me to be able to audit value for money in areas such as the administration of Scottish income tax. And Ian Gray led on that discussion. And it says just before that, effectively, there's a veto by the controller of Auditor General. So if, if, if we can't audit what we think we should audit, and we can't require the National Audit Office to come and talk to us, how on earth do we provide that scrutiny and accountability to the Scottish public? I'd start off by saying I wouldn't want you to take the impression away that relationships between us are anything other than very professional, very cordial and very effective in my views. Um, as I said earlier, I think what we're looking for is making sure that if problems do emerge, there's a strong basis in the framework for resolving that and that this, this Parliament's interests are respected and reflected as far as possible. Um, we've highlighted the one area, which is provisions for value for money audit in HMRC around income tax and potentially VAT in future. Um, um, our experience, your experience, I think, has been that um, the Comptroller and Auditor General and his team have been very willing to come to this committee to talk through the work that they've done and to take away suggestions for future work. So, in my view, we can make this framework work as it stands. Um, I think it's worth you being aware of where I think the scope for strengthen it, strengthening it, not least so that in future if you say, why can't you do, do that, I can tell you what the process is that we've been through. And secondly, as I say in my response, um, I think it's important that it is part of the review of the fiscal framework that's due to take place by 2022. Um, by then we'll have a bit more experience of how it's working. Um, I may have brought to your attention areas where I think it would have been good to do some audit that I've not been able to, or there may be areas that you would like to see audited that we've not been able to respond to. Um, so I think what I'm doing is highlighting an area where I think it could be further strengthened, not a fundamental concern about the framework as a whole. I mean, I have to be honest as well, I, I would have thought that these kind of agreements would have been kind of enshrined in the first draft rather than us having to go through a process of expressing concern about something as fundamental as this. Because as we look slightly ahead to the future post-Brexit, there are going to be a number of operational frameworks, we are led to believe, that will manage certain processes and devolve responsibilities that come back from Europe and so on and so forth. If this is the first example of a an agreed framework, I'd be a little bit concerned, particularly if we ha we are clearly saying we do not have the powers that we think to enable us to audit and scrutinise functions carried out on our behalf. So I'd be concerned about that, Elsa, convener. Do you want to respond to that? Um, I'm very happy to. Yeah. I, so we, I, as, I, as I said in my previous response, th this is an area where we would see the Scottish Government's and Audit Scotland's and Scottish Parliament's interests is all aligned. We have obviously raised that point. Um, the draft that you have in front of you is the compromise so far. We will, we will raise this point again and we will represent the views back from the Parliament. Um, given the, the quite reasonable strength of feeling about this, if, if the committee um, were particularly wanted to underline the point, um, the Chief Secretary has written to the convener to draw attention to the draft framework. It would perhaps be possible for the convener to consider writing directly to the Chief Secretary, to the Treasury, to, to highlight the, any of these important concerns from the committee. Willie Coffey. Last point, I know other members want to get in. Just on the issue and the, and the main principles of the draft, paragraph three, it's about information sharing. From what I can read there, and it's quite difficult to understand the, the language here, if we request or require information, we're not allowed to. We've got to request it of our own government to make a request of the other government to then make a request of their public body. I mean, this is like building in red tape. Sure, surely, to goodness, we don't want to agree to a process like that that makes it more difficult for, say, a committee like this to obtain information on an issue like the Scottish Rate of Income Tax, for example. Again, I think we would uh, entirely agree. Um, we're not sure. But why would um, we in Scottish Government wish the committee to have to ask us and then we have to go and ask someone else and perhaps what, if what is provided does not meet the committee's needs then we're acting as a go-between um, so we would be we would be content to obviously to have the the um, provision for a direct contact and it's another point we can raise back again with 
but why is this in there in this draft? It's so silly to have that in there. Surely we saw that that was ridiculous to have that kind of arrangement. Why is it in there? Um, well, not everyone necessarily has the same perspective. <laughs> so it's not your This is not our perspective. It's in, it, this is somebody else's. There, there are other parties to the drafting of this agreement. Well, can I have your opinion on, on that, please? Um, I, it's primarily a matter for Scottish Government rather than for audit, um, but I think in discussion with my team, our view is that that's an unnecessary step in the process. Um, it should be possible for the Scottish Parliament to request information from a UK body um, which is significantly involved in delivering devolved services. OK, Alex Neil. On that, on that very specific point, because buried in here is a suggestion, for example, that if this committee wanted information from HMRC, we've got to go through the Scottish Government. Why? Sure much to add to my previous comment, Mr Neil. Right. that there ought to be I, a I mean, I, 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 I would regard it. that as absurd. We would go straight to the HMRC and we would expect them to respond to us in the same way they would respond to the Public Accounts Committee in the House of Commons. In relation to devolved matters, absolutely. Yeah, I think that would absolutely. be the sensible way of And I think it. we need to be very explicit about that and we need to explain to the reserve bodies that that's how we would intend to operate. Um, you know, we're not waiting on them telling us what we can and cannot do as a parliamentary committee. We'll tell them. I think the only thing I can add to that um, is that um, over the... Uh, development of Scottish income tax powers, HMRC have been very willing to come to this committee to talk about progress. But that's a change um, of attitude because I remember when HMRC wouldn't even come to a committee of the Scottish Parliament. So we have to build in a process, you know, and, and the people who came from HMRC, as you rightly say, Auditor General, were very cooperative, very cordial. Same with the National Audit Office, the, audit, the Auditor General from down south, the Comptroller and Auditor General, very pleasant, very cooperative and all the rest of it. But we cannot rely on his, the, the personality of the current office holder. We have to have a system that guarantees our rights as a parliament and as a Scottish government, uh, no matter who's in office, either up here or down there. Entirely, and I think it's why this framework matters. Yes. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. I only have a, a couple of follow-up questions based on the, the line of question that we've just had. Uh, looking at the principles for accountability and devolution on page 10, there's a principle 5, uh, which talks about a public body may provide, or let me change the emphasis, a public body may provide information, advice or reporting direct to the legislature of another jurisdiction voluntarily. Uh, when might it do that? Do you have any examples? Um, I think I'm going to ask Andrew if he's got an example from the work we've done on the drafting. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, of course, there's a range of kind of work going on um, across Scottish government um, in kind of you know in the context of kind of drafting this framework as regards kind of audit and uh, accountability. Um, now, um, you already have kind of work going on with regards to. Um, the Crown Estate, um, that was the Crown Estate Transfer Scheme, um, which uh, began on the 1st of April of 2017. You have the Railway um, Policing Bill, which um, is now an act. It received royal assent in um, August 2016. You have the um, statutory arrangements in um, Section 66 of the Scotland Act, which mean that uh, reserved bodies also lay their accounts with um, the uh, Scottish Parliament. These are bodies such as Ofcom, uh, off Jam and the uh, Commissioner of the Northern Lighthouses. As for kind of non-statutory um, provisions, which uh, I believe is at the heart of your question, Mr Kerr, um, of course there's a range of work going on at, uh, in Social Security at the minute in terms of concluding MOUs, um, in terms of concluding kind of service level agreements where we need DWP to uh, carry out kind of devolved activities on our behalf as part of the safe and secure transfer of Social Security powers. So um, I suppose kind of in sum, um, yes, there's a range of both kind of non-statutory and, non uh, and statutory work um, between kind of various policy leads in the UK government and the Scottish government, which is ongoing um, in the context of us drafting this audit and accountability 
framework. That's helpful, thank you. Uh, and sticking with the clarity point uh, that we've examined a few times, uh, looking at these six principles, there are various terms spread throughout them, uh, which will no doubt mean something to uh, perhaps you chaps, uh, but don't necessarily mean something to me, uh, so, or don't tightly mean something to me, like parliamentary bodies requesting legislature, an, an equivalent body, uh, and you know, even we could extend it, Colin Beatty talked earlier about the distinct and significant impact, you know, that it doesn't really mean something, uh, or it might mean something to you, but not to me. Uh, so will there ultimately be some kind of glossary, uh, some kind of defined term section, which will clarify these sorts of issues? If you would find that helpful, I'm sure that could be added. <laughs> Thank so, you. Can I, yeah. Yeah, and, I, uh, yeah, Andrew wants something? to say something yes. about that. Go on. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, we have tried to clarify some of the terminology up top in terms of, i.e. in the first section of the document, in terms of kind of what accountability means, in terms of what service delivery means, in terms of what a UK um, public um, body is. Um, but certainly, as Alan always said, we're here to listen today. This is a draft. It still needs to go to the Joint Exchequer Committee, which is the formal form of the UK government we have for agreeing these things. So again, kind of building on Mr Beattie's um, point, um, if a glossary of the terms would be helpful, then we are more than happy to, to provide that and um, further refine some of the words and make it more accessible in what is um, quite a technical, technical area, of course. My personal view with that <coughs> is that that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think actually before I read the framework I was expecting a bit more of a, a legal document and I don't know if that developed slightly on, on, on Liam Kerr's. Now maybe we don't need the you know the where to fors and you know their two froms and clause three C two one. But it just needs I think a bit more structure and adding in the, the definitions and then looking at the terms that may be common in use but may not have an exact legal definition, which might slightly contradict the, the clarity aspect, but may make it easier in the long term to, to understand. I wanted to ask um, maybe the Auditor General just a, a point where, if I understand it, there will be areas where you're relying on work done by the, the, the National Audit Office. Um, not quite in the sense I think you're asking the question. The arrangements that are in place around HMRC um, for the financial statements audit um, are very clear that the Comptroller and Auditor General carries out that audit. He has statutory rights of access, which I don't have. Um, and under the existing Memorandum of Understanding, when he reports on the Scottish rate of income tax, I provide an additional assurance report to this Parliament, um, which uh, provides assurance that I think they've done the work according to the professional standards and in the right areas and can set it into context. So I'm not taking reliance in quite that way. So in that circumstance, would you have a discussion beforehand as yes. to the, the level of work they would do? Mark, do you want to talk through how that's worked over the first three years? So in terms of how that's worked, there's a conversation between ourselves and National Audit Office where they very much carry out the work. They're interested in our views and the sort of issues and risks that are important. Uh, the Controller and Auditor General made the point to this committee that from their perspective, that's a helpful process and they, uh, 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 he, he recognised, would be uh, very keen to make sure when we suggested that they covered a certain area that they did address that in the course of, course of that work. Context, the numbers might not be particularly material, but in a Scottish context, they could be very material. If they weren't using the right level of materiality, what, what could you do about it? Yeah, so again, to, the way in which the system works at the moment is that we'd have a conversation through the course of the audit to make our views known, and at the end of the process, uh, the Auditor Generals had the opportunity really to give to state our view where we felt that they weren't using the in, in those circumstances they hadn't used the right level of materiality so there is no to be able to reflect Scottish interests. Process to resolve a disagreement there. But the process is, as Mark said, for me to report that formally to this Parliament. I don't audit HMRC's collection of taxes that. and there are statutory um, restrictions on rights of access to HMRC. Because in in, in your um, your comments you talk about agreeing approaches, discussing approaches, working together, but there doesn't seem to be a way to actually resolve that if they don't do the work you want them to do, um, you could do anything about it. Um, I think it's, it's worth just taking a, a wee step back. Um, the 
the financial order is um, governed by statute in the ways that I've described for good reason. Um, there is a separate statement, an account of uh, Scottish income tax, and in due course I'm assuming the assigned VAT revenues as well, which the CNAG audits in terms of the materiality that relates to that account, not lost within the overall um, revenues and much smaller expenditure of HMRC. Um, so there are professional safeguards there. And I think it um, is extremely unlikely that we would see circumstances where the Comptroller and Auditor General wants to be in a position where he was reporting on HMRC's activities and I was reporting to this Parliament saying I think that work doesn't cover this Parliament's interests. In practice I think that's actually quite a strong safeguard. I think we've heard comments from others that we're, we're relying on how it is now and how the good relations are. You don't feel there's a need to have some form of fallback position? I feel that much more strongly in relation to value for money audit than I do the collection of tax revenues because of the provisions that are already in place for separate tax accounts for those revenues. Okay. Could I just go back to the comment I think earlier about, um, and you can maybe just remind me, we were talking about if the Auditor General disagreed with the accounting officer on an issue, or you relied on the accounting officer deciding they wanted to take um, you know, a suggestion or a recommendation. Referring to the question that Mr Beattie asked, which was about the accounting officer's decision about which accountability model they would apply, um, that's less likely to be in relation to one of my recommendations than simply in, in the um, operation of a UK body and the accountability relationships that it puts in place. But, but if there was some disagreement between you and an accounting officer, you would then just report it to, to us, the Parliament? I'm, I'm struggling to think of a situation where I would have a disagreement with an accounting officer of a UK body because I don't audit any of them. Uh, I would be much more likely to have... Uh, it, the situation is more plausible that I would have a disagreement with the CNAG about the need for a piece of value for money audit in a UK body rather than a, a disagreement directly with the accounting officer. Um, I think there may be a question in there for the Scottish Government team about what happens if they disagree with the model that an accounting officer chooses to apply under uh, the category of public, public bodies with more than one type of service delivery. But I don't think it's something that I'm likely to be to have a concern about from my perspective. I just ask a general question to the Scottish Government um, people here. You know, having come to this and seen it's been going on for a number of years, how long have you all been involved in it and uh, have you been involved throughout? Throughout, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I have been involved since I came back into this role uh, about a year ago. And Andrew's similar? Yes, time, well, I think. I've been involved from the start with, uh, with AD. Right. Can just clarify your question, Mr Bowman? Involved in the preparation of this document or...? Well, the framework talks about you know, going back over a number of years and referring back to previous um, committee meetings in, in, in the Parliament. Uh -huh. And we're picking these up now. Um, some of us, I'm sort of new to this, and I was just wondering if the Scottish Government officials have been involved okay. throughout this process. Okay. Did you all answer there? I think, I think so, yeah. was just in... Had Great. You, had yes. you finished? Uh, no, uh, I'm was involved it? from... Well, that was it. Yes, certainly since we have been drafting this uh, framework document. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, page 26 uh, contains further information on Model D... And the flowchart says Scottish MPs challenge on devolved impacts, but there's no explanation as to what this means. Um, can you tell me how it's decided whether a UK government decision might have a distinct and significant impact on devolved matters in Scotland? And also what the role for Scottish MPs is in this, if any? Um, so I, I think the... Well, Andrew may wish to expand on this, but I think I read the, the Scottish MPs' challenge on devolved impacts as, as the normal role that, that Scottish MPs would play if they, were, if they felt that some um, matter that was uh, under the jurisdiction of the UK Parliament was very relevant to Scotland. They would, they would raise that. They have their mechanisms to do so. Through questions in the House of Commons or Scottish Fair Select yes. Committee? Just those existing mechanisms? Those existing mechanisms is how I read that. Was that correct, yes. Andrew? Yes. In my understanding. Do you want to say something? Well, Indeed. Presumably they would have overall sight of this, yeah. as we do here. 
Okay. The, the, the representative not, I imagine. Thank you. Um, can I ask Eleanor Ryan, um, are there any concerns that the Auditor General raises in her report that you disagree with? Um, there, there's no, we have no fundamental disagreement with any of Audit Scotland's points. Mm -hmm. um, we, we will happily re represent them yet again in the, in the conversations with, mm -hmm. um, with UK officials, but we recognise that um, Treasury officials are also in discussion with the National Audit Office, and there may well be comments from the Public Accounts Committee as well, so that the eventual framework is likely to, to be a compromise amongst all the points of view okay. expressed. So we're likely to see the Auditor General's concerns reflected in the in the next draft or final draft. Or I can I can undertake that we will feed them back and we mm -hmm. will seek to have them reflected. I can't guarantee that that will be the outcome of the discussion. Okay, thank you. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses this morning? Okay, can I thank you very much for your evidence? I now close the uh, audit committee to the to public session. Thank you.